Welcome to Post Do, regenerative conversations exploring overshoot grief, grounding, and gratitude. I'm your host, Michael Dowd, and in this episode, I speak with one of my favorite authors, James Howard Kunstler. Jim has written several classic non-fictional accounts of a post doom world, The Long Emergency, Surviving the Converging Catastrophes of the 21st Century, and Too Much Magic, Wishful Thinking, Technology, and the Fate of the Nation, are both highly recommend. His world-made-by-hand novels are one of the best fictional portrayals of a post-doom world. And then his most recent book, Living in the Long Emergency, Global Crisis, The Failure of the Futurists, and the Early Adapters Who Are Showing Us the Way Forward. As you'll hear or see, Jim and I had fun in this conversation. Well, Jim, it's been a absolute delight for me thinking about uh, going to have this conversation. We, when we talked, uh, what was it, five years ago, I guess, on the future is calling us to greatness series, I really didn't get overshoot back then. I didn't really get the things that you and uh, others, people like John Michael Greer, uh, Dmitry Orlov, and many others, but especially the three of you, were saying so clearly. And I get it now in spades. And so I'm, I'm much, uh, I, well, I'm not even much less a techno optimist. It's like that's the opposite um, of, of where I would be now. And uh, since I uh, read your book, Too Much Magic, which I thought was great. So I'm going to ask you toward the end of this conversation to talk a little bit about your various books and stuff. But um, for those people who are coming to this bo- post-doom conversation and uh, may not <laughs> be familiar with you and your work, uh, if you could just uh, give us just a little sense of sort of what you're about, what you're up to, and especially what you're concerned about or um, focusing on these days. Well, I started to get tuned into these issues about what, what's happening to us uh, and where we're going in the future. When I wrote a book about the fiasco of suburbia back in 1993, it was called The Geography of Nowhere. And that led me into a consideration of uh, where we're going with our oil supply. That led me to a book that I wrote a I wrote several books about uh, urban design and and, uh, cities. And then I wrote a book called The Long Emergency, which was about the global energy predicament and the economic and financial problems associated with it. Um, Then I started writing a four book uh, novel series Mm -hmm. uh, called World Made by Hand with uh, that was the the kind of banner uh, and the, the title of the first book. Uh, they were four novels set in a post-economic collapse, uh, small town, northeastern American future. And uh, meanwhile, I also wrote another book called Too Much Magic. And the um, uh, subtitle of that gives you an idea of what it was, uh, uh, technology, wishful thinking, and the fate of the nation. Yeah. Uh, ironically, I wrote... Uh, a book about wishful thinking just when the nation was entering a period of profound collective wishful thinking and they didn't really want to hear about it. Um, and uh, so uh, where, where am I now? Um, well, I've, I've published uh, another novel in between and uh, I just finished writing a book. The, the working title of it was Now What? Yeah. But the publisher didn't like it, so they changed the name, uh, the title, to uh, Living in the Long Emergency. Uh, and anyway, that's coming out in uh, March of 2020. Wow, that's great to hear, because I've read um, The Long Emergency twice. The first time was probably six years ago, and then reread it uh, only about a year and a half ago, and was actually delighted and uh, actually not surprised, I guess, but that... Ninety percent of it felt completely current, not outdated at all, yeah. even though it was written back in two thousand and five um, and then too much magic I reread when I was particularly interested in countering some of the techno optimism the techno utopianism techno fetishism uh, that is <laughs> pervasive in this culture um, and so anybody listening to this or reading or watching this uh, conversation, do check out especially those two books, the long emergency and um, uh, too much magic. Uh, and, and if you like novels, if you like fiction, uh, Jim's works related to that are just priceless. Uh, yeah, I'm very proud of the World Made by Hand series. Uh, they were done with uh, considerable artistry, and I, uh, I really h- had a great time writing them. 
Yeah, well, it, it's it's so different than a fi than fiction. I mean, fiction is so different than nonfiction. And I I found myself listening to them. I I really enjoy audiobooks. So I was grateful that uh, that your stuff was available in in uh, in audio. Well, Jim, I'm curious around this whole meme or language of post doom. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, the book that you sound like you just finished. It will be coming out in 2020. Uh, sort of now what? Uh, Roy Scranton, of course, wrote a book, We're Doomed, Now What? You know, the whole sense of, okay, people who get overshoot, who get collapse, who get resource depletion, get peak oil, et cetera, et cetera. We still have to live lives. We have to wake up each day doing what, whatever we can do to make whatever difference we can make. And I'm curious, what language do you find yourself using? Obviously, the long emergency is sort of is your brand. Um, but in addition to that, well, say a little bit about that for people who aren't familiar with that, that meme, the long emergency, but also any other language that you find useful about speaking about these contracting or uh, degrading times. Well, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the novels because that, that whole thought experiment of trying to imagine what life would be like after a set of really traumatic economic and social disruptions and political disruptions, you know, that was a, a really important exercise for me because it allowed me to attempt to develop a comprehensive view of where we were going. And, you know, I, I think what, what it really amounts to, I said pretty much the same thing in the nonfiction books, right. that, you know, we're heading into a reset of the terms of uh, human life and the human project. I am not a doomer uh, in the sense that many people imagine. I think the human project is going to continue, but I think that it is going to take the form of a kind of time out from progress as we've known it. And especially from the march of technological wonder and, and uh, uh, innovation that we uh, are so marinated in. So that's, you know, I, th I think the big question is, if we have a setback, and I think, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly going to have one, uh, the, the real question is, what do we set back to? Yeah. You know, are we going to set back to something like the terms of living in 1820, or are we going to go medieval? You know, are we going to go totally dark age? Uh, you know, the... Yeah, it's not that difficult to see um, human societies slipping really badly. Yeah. Because once, once certain arrangements and institutions fall apart, uh, a, lot of, a lot of other stuff goes with it, and uh, they're not easily recaptured. You know, when the, when the Romans left Britain, uh, I think it was around uh, in 300 AD or so, um, the Britons stopped bathing and stopped making ceramic pottery. Mm -hmm. they, they forgot how to do that stuff after a while. And I think we're going to see a similar kind of forgetting. And, um, but I, I do think that human beings are resilient and resourceful uh, and we'll find a, go to, a way to go on. Uh, the main caveat is that we're going to go on with a whole lot fewer human beings on the planet. Let me ask a question related to your own um, your own journey. I mean, the heart of this particular podcast series is really um, inviting various thought leaders, authors to to who get the big picture, who get contraction. How did you come to that? How you process that, either gradually or suddenly over time, um, uh, and how that sits with you even now? Well, like so many things in uh, uh, human life and human existence. Uh, it was an emergent process to discover where we're at. And it came to me simply from writing the books that I wrote. You know, I, when I wrote The Geography of Nowhere, it led me to a consideration of how we were going to continue living in this suburban fiasco uh, with, a, you know, with an oil predicament gathering in the background. Yes. Uh, you know, th that led me to write The Long Emergency, which prompted me to explore the oil industry and the, and, and, you know, how it works, where it's going, the geology. Um, uh, the one thing that I missed, of course, like a lot of other people, was the shale oil revolution, so-called, the shale oil miracle. Right. But, you know, that, um, that it was an impressive financial stunt, really, and technological stunt. 
but it was a stunt. Right. You know, and it's going to prove to be short lived. The whole thing was based on uh, uh, ultra low, uh, near zero interest rates and, and uh, accumulating enormous amounts of debt to perform these operations to jack up American uh, oil production really quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the problem is the geology itself of shale is very um, unfavorable because the wells deplete so quickly and they require so much, uh, such a continuous flow of, of uh, capital to keep on going. And now that the companies doing it have demonstrated that they can't make a buck doing it, the, pro the probability is that they're not going to get future loans uh, because they've already demonstrated that they're kind of insolvent. So. Yeah. That whole thing is uh, problematical, but you know the uh, the public, meanwhile, uh, has been the public is tremendously confused. Look, the, the the public, the American public, is living in an atmosphere of utter informational chaos. Mm -hmm. uh, they're being uh, subjected to, among other things, a bad faith, dishonest uh, campaign by their politicians, um, and not. And not simply from the right, by the way. You know, in fact, uh, I would maintain that more bad faith is emanating from the left these days than anywhere else. Um, and in the meantime, they're leading frantic lives while their middle class law, while their middle class existence is compromised, and they can no longer uh, make a living. And they're scrambling to pay their bills, and and uh, you know they're kind of frantic and desperate. So, you know, between the informational uh, uh, cloud or, or, or bad weather and the economic distress, I think it's hard for them to make uh, sense of anything that's going on. So uh, meanwhile, uh, the people who are in charge of things in business and government and, and uh, elsewhere are working very hard to try to keep this gigantic machine going. And it's kind of foundering and, uh, you know, they take desperate measures, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the main one being that in order to keep these operations going, we have to borrow monumental amounts of money from the future. And now we're running out of our ability to do that, right. you know, to, uh, to accumulate any more debt. So we're coming to some kind of a, an inflection point where a lot of these incongruities are going to have to resolve and probably in, in a, you know, traumatic and disorderly economic political reset. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, what, uh, it's interesting. Connie and I have had sort of a, one of our little rituals is uh, pretty much every morning I read aloud something to her. And typically over the last several years, um, on Monday, Friday, I read you. And on Tuesday, Thursday, I read oh, thank Dimit you. Dimitri. And then on Wednesdays, I've been reading John Michael Greer. So I, I want to ask a sort of practical question, which is, are there any tools or practices or exercises or philosophies? I mean, what is it that allows you to be so consistently, like, I, I'd, love to, I'd love to know what your uh, writing discipline, like, do you write hmm. from this time to this time every morning? But you have a practice and uh, a, a, a discipline that's, that's so admirable and enviable for those of us who aspire to be writers. Um, so any practices that help you stay on purpose and relatively uh, happy and joyful um, in the midst of these crazy chaotic times. Naturally, by disposition, a cheerful person, uh, at least now. Uh, I had a difficult adolescence and uh, my next book is going to be about uh, the difficulties of, uh, of uh, growing up, especially as a young man. But uh, I've become a cheerful, purposeful per person. I discovered because of the difficulties of, of my youth that uh, the most important thing is understanding the difference between thinking about stuff and getting stuff done, you know, between uh, cogitating and acting. Mm -hmm. And by acting, I don't mean on stage or in the movies, right. you know. Uh, so it's very important to take care of your business. And there are uh, so many forces in the, the human personality that tend to militate against that, that, you know, it, it, it takes some energy to overcome that, you know, the, now it happens that I really enjoy composition. I really enjoy writing. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Um, it is, you know, there's a wonderful book by um, a, an author with a very strange name uh, from <laughs> Central Europe. His name is Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Oh, yeah. And the book is called Flow. And it's about the whole process of engagement with the task, you know, and getting into a flow state. And I'm very fortunate that I can do that fairly easily because I enjoy the process. Uh, One of the reasons is that I have a somewhat malicious sense of humor and uh, I get a huge kick out of that. Uh, (laughs) So do many of us who experience it. As anyone who reads my twice a week blog. Um, So that, you know, that works out pretty well. Yeah, I've had my health problems, you know, now that I'm 70 years old, holy cow. You know, I've had, I had some problems in my 60s. You know, I got cobalt poisoning from a bad hip replacement. Uh, you know, I had a little bit of heart trouble that is now okay. Um, yeah, I had three hip replacements. But, you know, I've stayed physically really active. And, uh, you know, I, uh, so I get a lot of oxygen in my brain. Um, my matrimonial history is pretty uh, deplorable. <laughs> I've been married three times and divorced three times. And, you know, I, all I can say is mea culpa. I, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't think I was that hard to get along with. Um, uh, I still have a girlfriend, at least a, as of this week. But you know, who knows? So, uh, you know, that's pretty much it. I, I moved uh, in about seven years ago to a piece of property in a small town uh, outside of Saratoga on the other side of the Hudson River. And uh, I, I kind of developed a small homestead there where I've got a large garden, a lot of fruit trees and uh, chickens. And that keeps me very busy, probably more busy than I want to. I, uh, three nights of the week, uh, I play music with other people and that's tremendously important to me. You know, I, I play in a contra dance band uh, and I pit play in a rock and roll band on Wednesday nights and on Thursday nights I play at a Celtic jam. And uh, it's just tremendously uh, satisfying and nourishing for the soul. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, you know, it's very, very hard to maintain a social network in these times when everybody is living in their phone. Yeah. And the only other thing that I can tell you is if, if you want to see your friends, you got to cook them dinner a few times a month. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to see them. And they may never do it for you because they don't know how to cook or their household is chaotic and they don't want you to come there. So, you know, you got to work hard at maintaining a social network. It's all a lot of hard work. And, uh, you know, luckily we get to sleep at night. Well, I am curious, in terms of your writing, do you type? What, do you write longhand journal first? and then? Oh, record? God, no. Uh, and then some people have begun, I've started even begun using uh, sort of the speech this dragon speaks naturally because I I find that that. I find that when I type and when I talk, I mean, I'm a preacher, I'm a public communicator. That's what I do instinctively. So I do some of my best thinking on my feet. I often will actually not purposely not give a church or an audience, a college audience more than a title and a short description. And I won't have anything more than three points because I want to generate, I want to create it in the moment. And I can sometimes do that when I'm, speaking rather than typing but uh, so you just you type on your your laptop or your your computer then oh yeah yeah i type on a, on a computer and i i actually really like that manner of composition you yeah. know I, i've gone through the whole the whole transition from uh typing on a smith corona typewriter i wrote my first four novels back in the 70s and 80s on a typewriter I wrote one of them in longhand, and uh, I had some uh, silly-ass CETA job. That was a federal program in the 70s that you know, was giving out kind of gold brick jobs to idle young people. And I, I sat in a state park office for three months and wrote a novel. They didn't ask me to do anything else, just sit <laughs> occupy a chair. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, that's a whole totally different writing process, right. because when you're writing on a typewriter, you got to really cut your losses as you go along. You can't move stuff around. The, the best you can do is, you know, cross it out with a pen or a pencil or use whiteout. Right. And uh, so you got to cut your losses. And that means that you do draft after draft after draft. It's like running laundry through a ringer. You know, <laughs> but with a computer, you know, you can move stuff around constantly. So it, the, the process of composition is a little bit slower in terms of words per day because you're going back and polishing up the stuff that you did the day before. But, you know, you advance and um, uh, 
the first draft uh, might take uh, three years, and the second draft will take three weeks. Yeah. yeah. By the time you get to the second draft, it's pretty darn clean. Yeah. So, you know, that's pretty much it. Um, uh, I, I do anticipate as part of the future that uh, the Internet revolution and the computer revolution is probably going to kind of fade away. Uh, we must remember that the internet depends utterly on a reliable electric system, and uh, our electric system is actually pretty janky, and uh, it has uh, kind of middling to poor prospects of being able to keep going as it is. So, you know, I don't expect the internet to continue. Uh, we have an awful lot of books in the world. You know, there are so many books published every year and we've got, you know, tens of millions of them out there. We've probably got a thousand year supply or more. Um, I don't know what will happen to the publishing industry. In uh, my World Made by Hand novels, there was no more publishing industry, but there was a revival of local newspapers. I mean, what I found helpful about those novels um, is that, as you know, so many people, when they let go of the myth of perpetual progress, they saw, uh, we just have a lack of imagination. People snap to apocalypse. It's all done, can't do anything. And so they, they have no way of thinking about living in a contracting time, in a simplified time, in a less energy dense, less technologically uh, um, sophisticated time. Um, uh, say a little bit about how you would, like if you were you know, talking to somebody who just still is sort of has this techno utopian vision of the future, what would be your, uh, sort of elevator smackdown, I'm curious. <laughs> well, you know, I don't actually engage in a whole lot of debates with other people, especially my friends, you know, who- Well, of course. Uh, for the most part are pretty typical, uh, you know, boomer liberals, uh, you know, with a, a techno-optimistic, uh, techno-narcissistic point of view. And I don't know, I, um, I, I don't really have an elevator pitch for that. You know, I mean, that's why I write books about it. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, I, I, I am uh, serenely confident that we're moving into a new disposition of things. And uh, my main concern really is the disorder that we're ge generating um, intellectually and politically and the amazing loss of an ability to think clearly, especially among the formerly thinking classes. Mm -hmm. And you see the rectified essence of this in the New York Times, mm -hmm. an institution that is just destroying itself with bad faith and dishonesty. Uh, and and a, uh, a really strange inability to think clearly about just about anything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that has been the main characteristic of the moment we're living in is that, is that we're living in an age of uh, really pronounced nonsense and it takes an awful lot of perseverance to wade through it and, and filter through it to try to establish what reality is. You know, one of, one of the uh, problematic things about the human project is that reality is really a consensual experience. That is, uh, it, you know, it's a form of agreement between lots of people about what is actually going on out there. And the agreement about what's going on out there now is completely crazy. You know, I mean, it's gotten to the point where we're so nuts that we're allowing uh, male athletes to compete in women's college athletics and pretend that they're women. You know, the, the supernaturalism of this is on a par with anything you'd find in the 12th century. Yeah. And, uh, uh, it should trouble us that this has happened after uh, after we've gone through uh, many decades of uh, you know a really robust scientific culture that you know that that uh, tries to vet the truth by testing the reality of things, and here we are now you know after you know the 20th century is over and now we're re we're re-entering this kind of supernatural world of of uh you know this enchanted world of uh um you know whatever you want to think about the world is true yeah i i read the book fantasy land uh last year oh, yeah and, by kurt anderson yeah you know i'm curious who who have been uh, like what has fed you nourished you what have, has inspired you like who are the authors or the 
the things that you've um, found over the, say the last decade that you found particularly helpful or interesting or inspiring? Well, a lot of the usual suspects, you know, who I consider colleagues of mine um, are pretty good at sorting out reality. Um, uh, you know, there's a whole other aspect of this for me, which is that I'm interested in the artistry of writing, not just communicating ideas about the future or, you know, uh, making projections. I'm interested in the sheer composition. So the writers that attract me are the writers who are uh, truly artistic. Tom McGuane was a great novelist back in the uh, uh, 70s when he burst on the scene. He's now 80 years old, you know. Uh, um, and he's been through a lot, but uh, his artistry was very, very formative for me. Um, I was deeply influenced by H.L. Mencken when I was a college kid, and I discovered him in the racks of the college book bookstore. He was pretty much forgotten by then and, and remains pretty forgotten. He was a uh, leading journalist of the early 20th century and a tremendous prose stylist and tremendously funny, and, and I got the first sense of how powerful prose could be, how muscular prose could be from reading him. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, the, the whole pantheon of the great post-war writers that we know about, you know, Updike and Philip Roth and Mailer and, and uh, Flannery O'Connor, you know, just a tremendous, uh, uh, tre tremendously gifted writers. The thing that surprises me about all that is how the whole institution of writing per se uh, is now uh, going going by. Mm. You know, the, the idea that a novelist could actually have some influence in the world is, you know, uh, becoming an obsolete idea. Mm. And yet, if you go back to the Time magazines of 1972 you know these people were hugely influential and mm -hmm. and uh you know the writers have very little influence these days so yeah. i don't know uh, uh but it's fun to do yeah. and uh, you know if you can barely scratch out a living doing it it's worth doing uh, it's better than uh, you know loading cinder blocks on a truck or or <laughs> driving a cab yeah. so yeah. amen <laughs> um I, I'm, I'm curious, how do you think of human history within the context of the larger history of life in the universe? Or is that just not something that you think a whole lot about? <laughs> well, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not a cosmic, a cosmic metaphysician or anything like that. But uh, I have what I call my new theory of history, which has the uh, virtue of being very, very simple. And it goes as follows. Uh, things happen because they seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. And then things unhappen because uh, time comes when they no longer seem like a good idea. And, uh, you know, World War I seemed like a good idea in uh, August of 1914. You know, they thought that they were going to all ride out on uh, uh, cavalry horses wearing gorgeous, splendid uniforms like the Napoleonic Hussars, and the whole thing would be over in three months. And guess what? It turned out to be the slaughter of the ages, this industrial slaughter. And it completely demoralized the Western world. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, it, it went a long way towards destroying Western culture. And uh, that's been a, a, pro, a, you know, a process of uh, disintegration that's gone on since 1914. Um, well, I was very impressed with the, the similar uh, uh, the similar origin of suburbia when I wrote about the fiasco of suburbia. And I, I take a lot of pleasure in calling it a fiasco. I've done that several times today. Uh, because, you know, the effects of it are just so tremendously negative for, yes. for the United States. But, you know, seemed like a good idea at the time. Really did. Now, you know, we had all this open land, a, a lightly populated continent that was still full of resources. And it really goes back to, you know, uh, the end of the streetcar era, uh, actually even before the end of the streetcar era, about the end of World War I, we embarked on, on the first uh, suburban uh, uh, motorized automobile-based suburban scheme. And then, you know, that, that really is one of the things that propelled the boom of the 1920s, and it all kind of uh, crapped out in uh, 1929. 
we then had a 15 year hiatus or so of the depression and the second world war. And then we resumed the suburbanization project with a vengeance after the war. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like a great idea at the time. And now you turn around, you see how Americans are living these desperate lives of alienation and isolation and families have been blown apart by this mode of existence. You know, uh, I'm writing a piece for some website right now about, you know, how, uh, you know, kids come home from school. Uh, their school, by the way, is this giant uh, institution that looks like an insecticide factory. You know, and they're marched around like slaves hour by hour in this thing. And education becomes a loathsome proposition. And they go home. Mom and dad, you know, have these uh, hour and a half commutes from uh, somewhere out in Sacramento back to Walnut Creek. And uh, they're not home. So the kid eats a few frozen burritos, you know, checks out a little pornography on the web, uh, listens to a little death metal or gangster rap. You know, and then we wonder why these kids are shooting up the school. The, the purblind uh, journey that we've taken into this predicament is really something. And we, you know, another one of my cosmic uh, or, or cosmic plus or minus theories about history is uh, that uh, I call it the, I, I didn't invent this term, but uh, the psychology of previous investment. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've made such enormous investments in this infrastructure for daily life that we can't imagine letting go of it. Yeah, right. And uh, we can barely even imagine reforming it. Right. And so, you know, the, the system that, uh, that we're living in is liable to just kind of collapse. And it's, uh, you know, it's going to lose its value and its utility. And then we're going to figure out what to do. Now, my own theory about where we're going is that uh, the places that are the most uh, disinvested and, and um, decrepit now, the, the small towns and small cities of America, are in some ways the places most likely to revive. Yes. Uh, for one reason, they are constructed on a scale that's consistent with the uh, resource realities of the future and the capital realities of the future. Um, the, I think the inland waterway system is going to be hugely important as we move forward because uh, the trucking system's uh, not going to be able to continue. So the places that are located on these uh, inland waterways, you know, the Ohio River, the Hudson River, and the, the canals that go to, the, to uh, the St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes themselves, the Missouri River system, the Mississippi River system, uh, you know, they're going to be tremendously important again. And the places that are located there are, you know, they're not going to be the great cities that they were in 1957, but they're going to be important again. And the bigger cities that we have, the giant metroplexes, are going to get in, an, uh, get in as much trouble as suburbia, but in a slightly different way, you know. But basically, because, you know, the, their scale uh, is uh, inconsistent with the uh, resource realities of the future. Mm -hmm. So... That's where the action's going to be. And, uh, you know, I think people who are interested in uh, uh, living in the future might consider very carefully where they're going to choose to live. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree. Well, as you know, Connie and I have a rather weird and itinerant lifestyle for eight, almost 18 years now. We've traveled North America living in other people's homes, usually their second <laughs> homes or vacation homes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've spoken to probably 2,700 groups uh, you know, basically where science, inspiration, and sustainability intersect. And now this whole uh, uh, long emergency, um, you know, the, the collapse of homo colossus in William Catton's terms, mm. um, and how to, how to support people in having healthy families, healthy relationships, healthy lives, and uh, purposeful work in the midst of contraction and collapse. Um, and uh, why that's so... Uh, vital. So that, that's what nourishes me. Now, you've used a couple of times a term that um, I want to make sure just doesn't slip by the, the listener or the viewer, uh, which is predicament. Uh, say, say a little bit about the difference between problems and predicaments. Well, problems uh, imply solutions. Uh, predicaments actually mean that there may, may not be a solution. Uh, I do think that there are intelligent responses to the predicaments we find ourselves in, um, but they are not necessarily easy 
things to do. You know, they uh, may require a lot of hard work or some sacrifice or major changes in your living arrangements. And uh, it's as simple as that. Have you given much thought to, I mean, okay, so you're 70 now. Um, I'm just wondering oh if, <laughs> I'm just wondering if, uh, uh, how you view your own mortality and, you know, eventually our species is going to go extinct, whether that's in 10 years or 5 million years, at some point that will happen. Um, how has or has thinking about mortality and death been helpful to you in this um, recognizing and really voicing long before a lot of other people were aware of it, the long emergency? I kind of got over my death terrors when I went through a bunch of medical crises and major surgeries in the, in my sixties. And, you know, I, there are a couple of near death experiences and, um, I, I'm not too freaked out about it. Uh, I, I do, I'm not religious, uh, but I do feel that, you know, we're part of the, this part of a universe of particles and forces and that, you know, the particles and forces will go on. Uh, we, they may not be aggregated in our particular corpus, but uh, the universe goes on. Um, I don't have too many firm thoughts about the next life or reincarnation or no next life at all. Um, uh, I'm not a Zen Buddhist, but I do think that uh, the moment that we're living in is, is pretty much the moment that uh, that's it. And, uh, you know, death is literally nothing. Uh, in the most profound sense of it being nothing. Uh, I, I'm comforted by the idea that, uh, you know, the X billions of years that I wasn't around before 1948 when I came along, you know, didn't bother me. So that's a comfort. Uh, I am not an extinctionist, um, or, or let's show, shall we say a, a, a near-term extinctionist uh, like uh, Guy McPherson and, and some of his followers. Uh, I think the human race is going to get through this bottleneck, but it's going to get beat up pretty bad on the way. Um, and the planet that we're living on is getting pretty beat up in the meantime. Um, the disorders that attend that process, I think, are going to be pretty frightful. And uh, I don't know, you know, I, I may not be around for m most of it but I may be around for part of it. Uh, right now, I, I find the political disorder that we're living through mm -hmm. to be pretty frightful. Yes. And as I said at the beginning, it's not all coming from Mr. Trump. You know, a lot of it, it's coming from all over, including from the thinking classes and the thinking uh, uh, branch of the political class who ought to know better, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, th just the bad faith that is being dealt out is just deplorable. and. And um, I mean that in the true sense of deplorable, not the Walmart sense. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm kind of disgusted by what I'm seeing in, in my people. You know, I, I'm a New York City Jewish liberal, you know. Uh, I was born and raised in the east side of Manhattan. Um, I haven't lived there for 50 years, but, you know, that's my origin. And I'm, I'm just appalled at what my people are, are doing right now. And by that, I don't mean Jewish people. I mean, you know, uh, Eastern intellectuals, yeah. generally. The people who work on newspapers, the people who write uh, magazine articles, yeah. um, you know, the people who uh, produce TV shows. Just, you know, the, the fog of bad faith is just enormous. So that's what bugs me. Well, the only thing that keeps me from being bugged more, I think, on that topic is uh, one of the things I've spent quite a bit of time over the last six years doing is studying the rise and fall of civilizations. I was first introduced, of course, through John Michael Greer, but then started reading Toynbee and Spengler and Vico and others. And I guess once I could step back and see, oh, societies that is unsustainable, human-centered civilizations tend to, and empires tend to contract. They tend to go through what Greer calls the senility of the elites, where <laughs> the, the, the politics right. tends to unwind in certain ways, the, the economics becomes insane in certain ways. And that's allowed me to sort of step back and, um, and with a sense of, oh, of course, of course, of course, kind of like run schedule, this sort of insanity. 
uh, which doesn't in any way keep me from th thrilling to hear how you uh, how you write about it on Mondays and Fridays. I just didn't really enjoy that. But I, I have less of an engaged sense of like, oh, this shouldn't be, because I have a sense historically yeah. of, oh, right, this is this is the way things this is the way things contract, collapse. Yeah, and I, I find as I get older, you know, I don't fulminate that much on, yeah. on the page in my writing. I, you know, I, I, I'm trying to be subtle, actually. That may, may, may not be evident, but I am trying to do that. But uh, I, I, I'm just so uh, uh, amazed at the idiocy that we're immersed in right now. And it's, it's just a spectacular spectacle. Oh, no, so that's yeah. redundancy, isn't it? Um, <laughs> It's such an amazing spectacle to see your culture coming apart, you right, know, right. Uh, especially in the places that ought to be the strongest points of adhesion, yes. you know, they're coming apart. Yeah. You know, just what's happening to the New York Times is just so stupendously weird. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, when those institutions go, boy, things can slip fast. What's your sense of remaining opportunities? Obviously, you're, you've mentioned already that you're not a uh, you're not a doomer in that sense. You see that there's a world beyond collapse. There's there's a world beyond uh, the long uh, emergency, um, and yet I want to get a sense of what's your sen what's your take on what's possible still, but what's no longer possible. Like where can we still make a difference, and where can we not make a difference anymore? I don't know so much about making a difference in terms of, you know, elevating the human race. I'm not much of an uplifter, but I, I do see a lot of potential for young people to find new vocations and especially in business because, uh, and by business, I don't necessarily mean big business. What I mean is just the daily uh, doing and getting of a society and everything's going to have to be downscaled. That's yes. obvious. But what that means is that there will be opportunities locally for people to start doing things, practical things, learning practical trades. And, and business at that scale is a practical trade. Uh, and, uh, you know, they can learn to make things. They can learn to move things. They can learn to uh, uh, sell things and wholesale things. And uh, I think we're going to have to rebuild these networks of local economic interdependency I'm not sure how elaborate that they're going to be in, in my world made by hand novels. They're, they're pretty crude. You know, they're, they're pretty uh, early 19th century. If young people think they're going to be marketing executives for Old Navy, uh, you know, or, or Google uh, uh, algorithm vetters, I think they're going to be disappointed by that outcome. And um, the really intelligent and shrewd ones are going to be looking into alternative ways for uh, uh, making a living and, and uh, you know, getting on with their fellow human beings. Uh, I, I do think that we are probably going to return to a more religiously organized uh, uh, community kind of uh, situation. In, in my world made by hand novels, I'm not trying to, you know, public, mm -hmm. uh, you know, self-publicized, but, but um, because the rest of the armature of daily life had kind of fallen away, you know, there's no, no longer any school systems, there's no longer any corporate uh, mm -hmm. activity, uh, there, there was barely, a, you know, any functioning law system. There was nothing for people to hang their lives on. And so the, uh, you know, the, the, the local uh, congregational church became the center of their social lives. It wasn't highly religious, mm -hmm. but uh, it, nonetheless, uh, you could see it developing into a larger force than it has been. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that that, I think that that'll happen. And right now there's so little for people to hang their lives on besides, you know, uh, the internet, uh, fast food and pornography in this country. That's about it. I was speaking to an audience about a month ago, and I, I've often said this, uh, you know, when I'm trying to help people see that there is life on the other side of contraction and collapse, mm -hmm. um, that in a, in a very real way, young men, I mean, as you know, there's a rampant addiction of m many young men, millions of young men, uh, not just in America, but many parts of the world, to internet gaming or internet porn or both. 
And that won't be the case when their communities need them. Uh, in, a, in a way, yeah. uh, an entire generation of young men who currently are wasting their time in front of screens are not going to be doing that when, when they're needed by their communities. And they know it. They've got actual meaningful work to do for the first time. Yeah, that. they've also been, you know, uh, um, kind of morally and intellectually devalued by, uh, uh, by their culture. Yes. Uh, and pretty explicitly. Yes. You know, I, I, I think the war on men uh, that Heather McDonald does refer to a lot is actually has actually happened. And it, it's had disastrous results for for men behaving in a purposeful way. And uh, and by that, I don't mean I mean, you know, you can be purposeful about something very negative and evil. You can be a school shooter or something. But to be purposeful in a in a in a pos positive and responsible mm -hmm. way, when you're living in a culture where anything goes and nothing matters, then responsibility doesn't matter. You know, accountability doesn't matter. But uh, you know, you asked me a while ago what I tell people uh, who uh, don't see that we're on on the road to having some serious problems. You know, I, I tend to repeat that phrase that Robert Louis Stevenson used, which was, you know, sooner or later, everybody gets to feast at the banquet of consequences. Yes. And we've forgotten that there is even such a thing as consequence in daily life. And there it is. It's going to come back to bite us. I want to invite you here at the end to just because um, you've you've mentioned uh, your your novel series, the World Made by Hand series, but I, I help people who have not yet read uh, or are familiar with the Long Emergency and um, and Too Much Magic. Just say just a little bit about that each of those, and then what if anything you would write differently if you were to write a revised, like where, where there might be uh, in your own estimation um, an upgrade or a revision needed. The Long Emergency was mostly a survey of the gigantic problems that are facing the human race at the what is now the sort of the end of the techno-industrial phase of history. And they were basically, you know, the uh, predicament with our energy supply, the problems with finance, money, and economy that grow out of that uh, energy predicament uh, and the reverberations of it. And some other problems that are arising, like uh, epidemic disease, uh, the antibiotic resistance of diseases, um, the ability of the human race to feed itself. The Too Much Magic book was simply, you know, it was, a, it was an update of the long emergency with uh, a lot more about the dangers of techno uh, narcissism and the belief that technology will produce uh, these rescue remedies that are gonna allow us to continue leading life the way we do. Is there anything you wanna say uh, in conclusion in this uh, post-doom uh, conversation? Well, uh, I wanna remind people that, you know, it, it's still possible to find joy in daily life. Uh, you know, it's not required to be depressed, you know, even given th this range of problems that we face and quandaries but uh, do the best you can. Uh, learn to make a distinction between just thinking about stuff and actually carrying it out and doing it and getting her done and go out there and get her done. Well, Jim, thank you so much. I just, just love you, your work. Uh, and I, yeah, well, next time we're up uh, visiting my dad, I'll, uh, I'll look you up again. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for reading my blog. Yeah. I'm sure. grateful for readers. Uh, I'm sure you are. And, and you can find Jim also on, on Patreon uh, and his, his blog, uh, Clusterfuck Nation, is a must read. So. Oh, you're even allowed to say that. Okay. So you can find my blog at kunstler.com. That's K-U-N-S-T-L-E-R.com every Monday and Friday by 10 o'clock in the morning. That's great. All right. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. For more information about this project, go to Post Doom dot com.